For nearly 29 years, this TV series has explored a wide variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, economic justice, the environment, and nonviolent social change. We especially provide information for the public to hear voices and viewpoints that are rarely heard in mainstream media. This month, we'll examine the problems of nuclear power, including the disaster that occurred in Fukushima, Japan, and the ongoing problems at Hanford in Washington State, where the same model of reactor is operating. We'll also gain insights into how people in Fukushima are dealing with their problems and how people everywhere can deal realistically with the dangers of nuclear radiation. We have two guests to help us explore these topics. Carolyn Treadway has been an anti-nuclear activist for decades. She also is a retired therapist and pastoral counselor and life coach. She loves the earth and wants to preserve it for future generations. She's a wife and mother and grandmother, a Quaker who lives in Lacey, Washington. With a lifelong connection to Japan, she visited Fukushima recently and talked with many people about the realities and how they are coping. Good to have you here, Carolyn. Thank you, Glenn. And our other guest is Tom Buchanan. He grew up in a farm in Oregon. He worked 18 years for Boeing commercial airplanes in the 18, 1980s, he worked for Greenpeace on a radioactive waste campaign, and he was working on that when Chernobyl blew up in 1986. Now he serves on the board of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, a nonprofit organization that works actively on several issues, including issues related to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Eastern Washington. Tom, I'm happy to have you here too. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Thanks. Let's start with some basic information from Carolyn uh, about what happened on March 11, 2011 in Fukushima, Japan. They suffered what have been called triple disasters, a very serious earthquake, followed by a huge tidal wave, a tsunami, followed by nuclear power plants melting down. What do we need to know, Carolyn, about these triple disasters? Well, they were really 
enormous disasters. It was a level nine earthquake out in the ocean. The tsunamis that roared in on land were um, up to 100 feet high, and um, so much was devastated. The area uh, in the north of Japan, um, on the map here you see Fukushima nuclear plant in red, and then above it Sendai. That's the area where we were and north of there. That area had, some of it had earthquake damage and a lot of it had tsunami damage and some of it also had the damage from the melted nuclear reactors. So the unlucky people, some of them got all three. This is an ongoing disaster. It's not over and um, it has the radiation from Fukushima, just like the radiation from Chernobyl, has reached the entire world. So we have some of that radiation here on the west coast of the U.S.? Some. Some, yeah. But it's hard to distinguish it between the background radiation. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, you have a, a personal connection with Japan that goes back to when you were just a kid. Tell us about that. That's right. So people say to me, why did you go? Why did you go there and see that? Well, my ties with Japan began when I was age three to five, and my parents, Ross and Libby Wilbur, were running a hostel where uh, Japanese Americans coming out of the intern camps during the war came to stay long enough for them to find their own housing and their own jobs, which my father helped them do. My mother ran a great big building, <coughs> this great big building, and my family, from the time I was three, to f four, and five, was my parents and me and dozens of Japanese Americans living in this big house. Then I went to Japan for j my junior year of college in Tokyo at International Christian University. This is me in 2013, not as a college student, but that building behind me is the classroom building where I had uh, a year of my life. And um, right after disasters, several psychology professors from my university went up to the disaster area immediately to try to find out how they could help. And they started uh, some clinics, counseling clinics, to help people deal with their trauma. I was privileged to talk with the, these professors and to visit their training center and their clinics. And at the clinic, we attended in Sendai, up in the disaster area, these women joined a support group, or became a support group for each other. They told about their experiences for the first time, because culturally you don't talk about your feelings. And so they shared with each other, and they were very surprised to learn that all of them felt the same. And uh, they are such an inspiration to me that they brought me back to Japan to learn more when I had an opportunity to take a learning journey with a group in a small nonprofit called New <coughs> Stories. This is our New Stories group at one of our stops, but we were privileged to go under the um, leadership of Bob Stilger, who had spent much of three years working with the people in Japan to try to help them find their way after all was lost. And he took us into the places and people he had worked with, and we got a much more profound look and connection than we otherwise could have possibly so, had. So this, this visit, this learning journey, was in November 2014. 14. And previously you'd been there in May 2013. 13. Yes, yeah. that's right. Thank you for adding that. Yeah. So our first stop as a group in the disaster area was to the town of Yugihama, which is quite near Sendai's airport. And this man was our guide, and he is standing in front of a map of the city, how it was. But he showed us a film um, of the unfolding of the disaster. He showed us the tsunami wave rushing in and so on. And so it was like we were right there. And as you can see from the photo, we were quite gripped by this experience. This is how Yugihama looked before and after and during and after. And we saw many more slides and films of, of other devastation and other places 
But as you can see, the tsunami did a really good job of wiping everything out. And, and you told me when we were preparing for the program here on the phone, uh, you told me the countryside is still beautiful, but it's deadly because, of course, you can't see the radiation. Right. For, that is true. So in the area we're looking at right here, it, this is not an irradiated area. And you can see the devastation. This is a school where the students, um, where, where townspeople knew to run to if there was danger. Here, if you made it to the third floor or the roof, you lived, otherwise you got drowned. Mm. And this is what it looked like uh, last November with everything cleared away. Nothing is allowed to be built in that area now. We um, were very impressed with this tour guide, our tour guide, because he said for the rest of his life he will be telling the story of Yugihama as long as he can so that people will not forget all that was and all that was lost and all that needs to be learned from them. But there was a second part of the disaster, or a third part, and that was the radiation. The radiation the, um, the meltdown of the nuclear reactors. And what happened was this tidal wave came up into the reactor building, short-circuited uh, the electricity, turned off all cooling systems, and reactors within a few days melted down. Three of six melted down. So this is a name that I think strikes fear into our hearts, Fukushima. Fukushima is the name of a town and the name of a province. The area in which this province is is Tohoku. The nearest we got to the reactors was here, and you are looking at a picture of reactor number two. And with the telephoto lens, it is so close that I can almost enter the control room door. But this picture, non-telephoto, shows me pointing at them, and you can see how far it is to them. And this picture of me look, is looking like the wrath of God I look awful. Mm -hmm. I felt awful. It was awful. This was the lowest point of the trip for me, to look at these reactors which have caused so much harm and to be so angry about it and upset and then just realizing these are simply buildings and they're doing what they've been programmed by human beings to do. But you're, you're drawing upon your own experience as decades-long work against nuclear power mm -hmm. as well as your lifetime of experience of solidarity with, with people in Japan. Japan. So you, to put those two together is, is really is powerful. Yeah. It was powerful for all of us, and we had a little impromptu memorial service right there on the spot. And then we went on driving throughout several prefectures. And this looks like an ordinary street scene, right? But in the front, there's a canister with a grid on top, and that is the dosimeter, the radiation measuring device. That's the millisieverts per hour there. And those were everywhere, and people were looking at them very carefully. We went into a village, Okuma, that had been entirely evacuated, and people were not allowed to enter it because they were kept away, uh, enter parts of it, because they were kept out by a fence with guards. Looking down that street, it looks just the same as looking up that street, which is where our bus was and we were standing. And we were talking to um, the Japanese trio there about what had happened and what it was like and what was going on. It was very, as you see my hand on my chest, it was very, very painful to hear it all. They told us that on this side of the street sits one house and on this side of the street sits, another side of the street sits another house. And in one house, it's declared by the government that it is unsafe to enter at all. And in the other side of the street, you can enter it for a few hours, a month or a week maybe. But if you live where you can't enter at all, you get a higher subsidy from the government than if you lived where you can get in a few hours. And it's causing great divisions between people. And it's all kind of ridiculous because radiation blows around in the wind. We next went to the home and factory of this young man, the beautiful, beautiful home, which is being cleaned by um, workers. The Japanese government is uh, sending great hordes of workers to clean the area. And cleaning means denuding the trees and denuding the, the 
cutting off branches, washing down the buildings, and taking up the top six inches of soil. <clears throat> so you can see it leaves this beautiful area totally stark, but it's so poignant to me because they only go a few feet into the woods and then they can't go farther and they don't go farther. And so the very next wind or rainstorm or snow melt will bring more radiation right back down to what was clean. At the end of our, stay, our very short visit there, because we couldn't be out of our bus too long because of the radiation, we, this man came out of the house, and it's his house. And he has decided to live there, even if it is um, in the radi you know, with some radiation. And he represents to me so very much. I admire his tenacity and his courage, but also his ability to make choices that are right for him. And we must remember that. We can think, well, why doesn't everybody move away? Well, would you like to move away from your family home of many generations and leave everything you've known and loved behind? I, I don't think so. <clears throat> so he's doing the best he knows how to do and by his choice. The rest of the family has chosen to move away. So families are being split. What happens to all this cleaned up stuff? Well, it's put in plastic bags. Would you believe it? Plastic bags. And they mount up and mount up, and they're put under more plastic. Great hundreds and hundreds of thousands and thousands of them all over the place. So right here in the middle, in these fields, is radioactive earth and debris in plastic, and life is trying to go on around it. We also visited um, an area, a town, Tomioka, which is still so radioactive it couldn't be cleaned up. So we saw it as if it had been right after tsunami. And it was so surreal. And this is the word that captured all of us, surreal, just surreal. You couldn't see radiation but it was there and it was lethal. This, then we went to visit um, the family members of TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company. And that, that's the company that owned the nuclear plants. Owned the reactors. And yeah. we talked with several of them. We talked with a group of them. Here are several of them. And this woman, um, I asked through translation, are you angry with TEPCO for the meltdown and for what's happened to your lives ever since? And they said, she said, no, we love TEPCO. TEPCO gave us a better life, better jobs, better schools. We love TEPCO. And besides, radiation is a man-made problem, so we think that TEPCO and others will be able to figure it out and will be able to move back to our homes. I wish I could believe her. This is the group. Our group was constantly pulled in two directions. We were in normal ordinary life, cushy life, beautiful meals, lovely inns we stayed in, and yet our hearts were back with those who had lost everything and were struggling to find a way just to live. And this pull back and forth was something we experienced constantly. We also were um, deeply moved by hearing stories of people who had done so much. Um, to come back and try to come back to life. This man owns a fish products factory that had been in the family for generations. The tsunami wiped it out, completely wiped it out, and wiped out his home as well. And he didn't know what to do and whether he could go on. And he was trying to clean it up and move equipment up to another location, but he was ready to give up. And a volunteer came to help and said, I'll see you tomorrow at the end of the work day. And that gave him hope. And so he tried and tried. And then many people from all over northern Japan and Japan came to help this keystone business get reestablished. And we were able to visit the plant that was reestablished. And at the end of our tour and time there, he showed us this plaque at the bottom of the screen, which has thousands of names on it. And we thought these were the names of the people who had perished. But no, these were the names of every single volunteer who helped rebuild. And every day, every person who works at the factory 
uh, honors those names. He calls his remaining employees my treasures. Wouldn't it be nice to be treasured in, by our employers? He closed with a very poignant story of finding a bottle like this strapped to a baby, a toddler, in the mud. And then he, and it, obviously the mother had tried to put a float on the back of the baby. He dug down further and found the body of the mother. And he said, everybody had a story like that. Everybody had their story of loss and of life and so on. And he said, this is who we are to each other. We must keep each other. We are floats who must keep each other afloat. Another woman, another person who did an amazing job was the woman in the front of the room seated with a green sweater. And she, without any experience, started to um, have a nursery school. She took us up to the top of the hill over the town and showed us that everything behind her in there was covered with water. And the children were in shelters and had nowhere to go and nothing to do. So she started a daycare center. And she noticed that everybody was kind of on a hold until a year later the insects, the birds, the butterflies, and, the, and so on started to come back. Then they felt they too could come back to life and go forward. People gave enormously to help the, the, the survivors in the Fukushima area. The man in black gave up a corporate career and has left up a very good corporate career and has left his wife and family in Tokyo and he lives full time up in this area to help the people. The man in the aqua sweater is Bob Stilger, our host, who has spent much time in Japan since the disasters helping people find new ways. And this man spends his time in the Fukushima area, in the irradiated, irradiated area. He too gave up his livelihood and came to volunteer. And the woman on the right moved from where she lived to the far end of the country of Japan where she uh, is working with and helping mothers and children who have fled the area, but all came from Fukushima area. But the people deepest and dearest in my heart are these professors who started the clinics and the trauma clinics. And they talk about the fourth disaster being how people of Fukushima area are being forgotten and there's not enough help and there's not enough support. And so I have made it my personal mission to try to gain support for them. So if anybody watching would like to join me in this endeavor to help uh, contribute financially to the clinics that will help with the trauma treatment, which is people are frozen in trauma and their life cannot go forward. And that was the market difference between the people who had the tsunami damage and the radiation damage. The tsunami people, they've been doing that for millennia. But the radiation is all new, it's all unknown. People don't know what to do. And these two valiant men and their teams are trying to help them. I'd like to help them. Would you help me help them? And, and the, <clears throat> the viewer should know that we'll have your phone number and email address at the end of the program with the credits. So they can okay. contact you if you want to, if they want to help right. out with that. Just like if they want to schedule you for a, a right. slideshow and right. discussion. Yes, I'd be very glad to give slideshows on this. And Carolyn, I just noticed today in the press, and we talked oh. about that already, uh, yes. that, that uh, out of 350,000 children that are measured every year for possible thyroid cancers and nodules, it doesn't have to be cancers, that now there's a count of 137 children that have uh, thyroid cancer. And this is something that's going to be ongoing because the children are even more sensitive than others in terms of gathering these kinds of iodine, radioactive iodine, into their systems. Mm -hmm. And it, it's 50 times what would be normal in terms of the cancers. Just a few would have it normally. Yes, just like one or two. These, these are 137. It was announced in the press, and people will see it after October 8th, which is where we're mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about. And you know, I don't know, did you, did you see any of those clinics or any of those testing areas when you were there? I didn't see them testing the children. Right. I visited this, the, psych, the counseling clinics. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, what, you know, when a disaster strikes, 
people can respond in practical and healthy ways or people can get stuck and fail to do what's needed. And you said that there's some of each there. The tsunami is a familiar kind of disaster and people can cope with that. The radiation uh, is kind of un unknown territory. And there's no guidance. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, we've covered a lot of that and, and we'll hear more of you <laughs> during the remainder of the hour. Um, the, there's something I'd like, yeah, I'd like you to close with uh, this. Uh, in the context of the wisdom from Fukushima, uh, you compiled a list of 10 lessons for life, and if you could read those. Yes, and this was, as I, re as I thought about our journey, what did we learn? And these were among many things that we learned. So live the life that is important to live. Never take life for granted. Honor those who have lost much. Keep on shoveling that mud. <laughs> Help others as best you can. Create ways to have hope. Find life again through nature. Build community. Protect and guide the children. Care for one another. This keeps you going and provides meaning for rebuilding your life. Thank you for sharing that. Now, we, we've been talking about what happened in Japan a few years ago, and we want to shift to the local aspect of uh, the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in the eastern part of Washington State, where the only remaining actively active uh, nuclear reactor is the same design, the General yes. Electric Mark One. Yes. Same design that, that melted down over there. I want to give some background and then we'll move on to some information from both sure. Tom and Carolyn. Um, it seems it can seem remote to have something in another part of the world because it's like another part of the world. But when we realize that we have a local connection, that that same model of nuclear reactor is here in our state, uh, and for people who don't know uh, the geography, Hanford is in the eastern part of Washington State across the Cascades. It's near the Tri-Cities of Richland, Pasco, and Kennewick. It's on the Columbia River, a few dozen miles uh, north of, of Oregon. The, the Hanford Reservation produced the nuclear material that went into the bomb that the United States dropped on Nagasaki, Japan in 1945. And the United States has made nuclear weapons material at Hanford for like 70 years. And the they also have a commercial power plant there. Now the power plant that's, that's there is called the Columbia Generating Station, CGS. It used to be part of the Washington Public Power Supply System. Whoops, whoops that's right. Which is a, 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 a really embarrassing acronym to call it whoops. Have a nuclear on that picture, the uh, that that uh, white area on that graphic of the or the picture of the plant uh -huh. is where the spent fuel rods are uh -huh. that have already been irradiated inside the the containment zone. But that area up on top is called the swimming pool because yeah. it's really not covered with any kind of major containment. Yeah, it, it's, it's really out in the open. It's certainly covered, but it's basically sheet metal. It's are, stuff you can buy at, at Home Depot. Yeah, what's there are up so on many problems with this. It's kind of like when, when Carolyn was showing us these bags of dirt, it's just yes. plastic yeah. bags. Yes. It's like the same kind of Mickey Mouse stuff goes into nuclear plants, and people don't realize it because it's, it's distant from us and the, they don't release information to the public. Yep. But this, this photo that we just saw was taken from across the Columbia River. It's so a slightly distance. upgraded uh, Mark from a Mark I that's mostly in, in Japan, but it's, it's pretty much the exact same. In mm -hmm. fact, it could be more dangerous, this Mark II version uh -huh. of the CGS reactor compared to the Fukushima yeah. reactors, which are all produced by GE. Yeah. All the engineers in the, in the mid-70s quit because after they did testimony to Congress, they uh -huh. said, we cannot go on producing this kind of fissionable material that will endanger the planet. I mean, they literally said, yeah. this is a dangerous reactor, and we tried to change it and tried to suggest things to change it, and GE wouldn't have a, a thing to listen to yeah. about it. And we have a number of these uh, operating, I think 23 was the number In I the United saw, States. and That's Carolyn right. told me Still on the phone now. when we were preparing for the program that uh, Diablo Canyon, California, has one on the Pacific Ocean coast and on several earthquake faults. Yes, and it's just, numerous earthquake faults. Yes, it's, it's, it's just 
uh, the most bizarre Mickey Mouse thing. And you think after all the the purported safety uh, criteria and, and evaluations, this stuff goes on. Well, one of the things that's happened over the whole era of nuclear power, commercial nuclear power, besides getting it wrong, saying that it's too cheap to meter, mm -hmm. another thing is that they've always used, quote, national security to cover things up. Right. So they've had a tremendous latitude in ignoring safety standards. Yeah. You know, they have a captive agency like the NRC that's supposedly regulating them. The and just like in Japan, commission. they don't yeah. they don't regulate. They're right. really captive. And another thing is the design itself. People out at Hanford are in many ways slowly responding to that the radiation out there in the way that people in Fukushima are. It's not as disastrous, but nuclear workers right. at that power plant especially when they change out the fuel every two years, or if they're do, doing work on mechanisms in that factory, they get exposed. Yeah. They, don't, they don't get proper uh, uh, protection. And guess what? They bring in itinerant workers. I, I read about this. You, you sent me some reports, and they, they have just a, a, thousand a, workers. A, huge, a huge rate of bringing in people to work temporarily, so you get your That's dosage right. of radiation but you're only temporary, so and then, then you're, you're out the door. Then you're out the door, and then they don't track you anymore when some yeah. later on, 10 years yeah. later, you're having it, lung cancer. It's just, it's just a, a, a scandal. But they've and, done the same thing in Fukushima. They yeah. have people that are working in very hot zones. It's much hotter yeah. in Fukushima yeah. than it is well, at, I, uh, out of Hanford. Yeah, but, I've read about how they, they, they bring in homeless guys, yeah. homeless people from, from Tokyo, and they have them work Suit a them while, up. and then you're off, out you go again. And, and, you know, they call them the samurai, the samurai organ. They try and pump people up, kind of like, uh, you know, possibly a football game. You're going to your, yeah. get your spirit up, and you're going to go in there and, and uh, donate to the people of, yeah. of Japan. But the really, samurai were the ancient warriors. Yes, yeah. and, and yeah. it's really uh, TEPCO is the one, and they're going yeah. to nationalize TEPCO. It's no, no longer going to be a private company. Yeah. They've lost so much that the government's going to yeah. have to take them all over. Yeah. Just, just to keep this thing going. Yeah. Um, when, when the nuclear plant at Chernobyl in Ukraine, it used to be part of the Soviet Union, melted down in 1986, and when Fukushima melted down in, in 2011, they released uh, radioactive contamination into the environment that contaminated people, of course, and it included cesium-137 as part of the stuff. Can you tell us what cesium-137 you know, no, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's one of the 45 different byproducts after the nuclear reaction. And one of the problems with cesium is that it locates, it seeks out uh, human tissue, uh, living tissue, and muscles especially. Uh, strontium, which is another characteristic mm -hmm. uh, byproduct, uh, very radioactive, seeks out the bone tissue. Mm -hmm. So you have two different places where you might internalize, mm -hmm. gather that material in, and then later on, you have a cancer or, or other yeah. failures in your organs. Because when it enters your body, it keeps on radiating and It radiating keeps on ticking. Radiating. That's yeah. right. And it doesn't something, you know, people aren't aware of how much is going to be coming in. Yeah. We have, we have a place where the tank workers out at Hanford, out the military reservation, don't even get enclosed oxygen for a long time because they're, it's too expensive for the U.S. DOE to give them mm -hmm. safety equipment. Firemen have th this equipment. Yeah. But in, in fact, it's only because the Attorney General's Office of the State and workers have said we have to have an enclosed air source to keep us from at least inhaling the chemicals and the radiation at this high-level radioactive mm -hmm. waste site. That is the kind of thing that has to be done, yeah. even at this level yeah. right now, to, to avoid more contamination. Yeah. Carolyn, you have a story about miscarriages in North Dakota. Can you share that with us? I have a story about one miscarriage that um, some a woman I knew in Illinois um, talked to me about because we were both very concerned about nuclear issues. And I said, well, what? how did you get started with this concern? And she told me that she had had a miscarriage while living in North Dakota. And when she had gone to the obstetrician and confirmed her pregnancy and so on, she was elated. But she noticed that in the obstetrician's office, there were um, 
lots of pamphlets on miscarriage. And she said, well, why? And that's a terrible thing to have out there. And she said, unfortunately, the doctor said, unfortunately, we need them. We have a lot of miscarriages here because we are downwind from Hanford. That is from Washington State all the way to North Dakota. And my friend lost the baby. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. That it, on, a, on, a, on a case-by-case basis, you wouldn't connect the dots Mm-mm. unless, like that obstetrician, you were attuned to the, the pattern going on. But we, we people, ordinary people need, need information. You know, we do have the equipment, and the Japanese have the equipment, and so do the Americans, to actually track the, the radioactive isotopes that are in your blood or in your system or in your tissues. It's too expensive, and it's too, it, it, it's going to wreck the nuclear industry if people start getting those measurements and mm-hmm. having them available. Mm-hmm. One of the things that gives me hope, not the fact that the children are getting cancers, but that the Japanese are taking, they're taking records yes. and they're responding carefully, to this and they're carefully. saying, don't irradiate my child, it's two, and give mm-hmm. thyroid cancer and cancers in general. Mm-hmm. Those women are going to stand up just like people have in the past. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to be one of those things that will help stop this whole thing. Yeah, they have stood up and they have protested mightily yes. against the restarting of nuclear reactors, but the government has restarted two of them recently anyway. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Tom, you told me that the meltdowns are not just theoretical risks, but they do happen. And you, you mentioned uh, the frequency of the average. Tell us. Well, if you if you measure from the TMI to the Three, three Mile, Mile Island, Island in, uh, what was that, meltdown, which, which was only 1979 in to the present, every seven and a half years we've had a melted down reactor. If we count the three reactors in in Japan. Chernobyl and TMI and divide it with the 35 years yeah. that's taken place. Yeah. That's the kind of, you know, we're talking about serious stuff. Mo- a lot of it has to do with aging reactors. The uh-huh. fact, not even just the fact that there's a earthquake zone like Japan. I mean, it's the most earthquake sensitive place on the planet. But we have our own earthquake right. zones here and we've had the same kind of, uh, but we also have problems with flooding. We have uh, more violent weather. Yeah. We have a lot of safety issues that are in the environment that will affect this right. older nuclear power plant out at Hanford right now, just right. just like it happens and, and, overseas. And a number of the other older ones yes. that are on earthquake faults and aging and and stuff. Um, you uh, you told me that the Columbia Generating uh, Station does not have an adequate backup plan for emergency power loss. And I read a report that you provided for me that said that they don't have a good water. I mean, the this ultimate is crazy. heat sink, the ultimate heat sink, especially with the GE reactors, it, the containment zone. One of the reasons why those engineers quit was that the containment s- a section that holds the actual fissioning reactor rods in there is too small. So when the plant water goes down, stops, and sits there, it comes to a boil within within 24 hours. And if you don't have power circulating that mm-hmm. water, mm-hmm. things start to steam up, build up. The hydrogen gas starts to the, the cracking of the zirconium cladding on the individual fuel rods starts to buckle, and then it sparks, and there's a hydrogen explosion. That's uh-huh. why these that's all these failed. Right. And one of the things that's a problem is that what do we got for backup out at Hanford? We have a fire hydrant out in the out in the middle, a fire hydrant, and a pumping fire truck. That's what they have for backup in terms of water that they're expecting to spray on the top of that reactor if it goes down in some way. They're still in la-la land that this isn't going to happen. That's the reason that they they think it's funny that they have an antique fire truck on the site that's going to give them support when the water goes down. Yeah, and when we were on the phone preparing for the program, you say, you know, although they they claim they have a good safety record. All you need is one bad day. Oh, yes. It's, it's like, you know, Whoa. Arnie really Gunderson says the same thing. If 30 years of production and one bad day in nuclear power yeah. is disastrous, yeah. it can be. You mentioned earthquakes, and I want to show the map that you had provided yeah. about earthquake faults. We don't think of Hanford as being a location with earthquake faults, but there really are the lines, the, the captions are too small to read, but this is the Hanford area. Uh, 
Mount Adams and the Cascades are toward the left. Walla Walla is in the lower right. Hanford the number two in the, the yellow middle. area, that's the actual Hanford uh -huh. site, and the number two is where the CGS reactor is. Right, the one that we're and, talking about. And the ones that are uh, in purple are the ones that have been identified before, and then mm -hmm. the blue on both ends, when they get longer faults, that, those can be more active because the actual faults are continuous. And then there's the uh, yellowish dots that are, uh, some of them are identified, some of them aren't, but they're part of ridges. Those are confirmed as very possible fault lines. Mm -hmm. So we have something like 12 new faults that have been identified since the uh, late 80s. Yeah. And uh, CGS has not, recognized, has not recognized any upgrade necessity for their power plant. Whereas the whoops number, uh, the WTP, the, the Waste Treatment Project building and pr production, which is number one, which is only 10 miles away from CGS, mm -hmm. has upgraded their facility. This is the one that's going to be doing a lot of the glassification for the waste okay. at Hanford. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what's important for people to know is uh, the Columbia Generating Station, CGS, was designed for a 6.9 earthquake, you told me but a 7.9 actually had occurred in 1872, which is not that long ago geologically. No. So we've already had one that was 10 times stronger, Yes. 7.9. And they relocated it. The earlier one was pl placed up against the Cascades, yes, I, and we're now at Entiat is where I, they yeah, think I it is. Yeah, I saw that. So, so the, where they thought that the epicenter was was, far, was farther away, but now they realize mm -hmm. that it's substantially mm -hmm. closer uh, than what they thought. So all, there's new information coming in, and like you said, in the 80s, they had new information, and there's been no upgrade. You know, we need to learn. We need to learn, especially from honest geologists. And of course, they they probably said the same thing about about the earthquake sensitivity in Japan. People wouldn't listen to That's them. That's right. They wouldn't. But listen. they they have a whole history of, of earthquakes, major plates mm -hmm. that have that have caused nine and yeah. eight magnitude earthquakes. Well, we have the same potential even out at Hanford. Right. And, and we have we have geologists who are saying what you know, what the realities are. There's right. one in a report that you had provided that I read, and I typed in what this person said in the report. Geologic studies conducted over the past 30 years have piled up a large volume of geologic evidence that indicates that the original design basis for the Columbia Generating Station seismic risk assessment significantly underestimated the potential earthquake risks. And, and this is like, no, no upgrades. We don't, we, we don't, uh, people still believe in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh -huh. NRC, that they actually can evaluate this evidence and tell the industry, I mean, legally they have that option to do that. Yeah. It turns they out that they don't, they don't do it do and it. that people who are active about pushing the issue of handling these reactors after Fukushima, they've been fired or had to quit. Yeah, and we know that, that there are a number of supposedly regulatory agencies that have actually been captured by the industries that they're supposed to be mm -hmm. regulating and mm -hmm. the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, is one of those. It basically functions like a very permissive arm of the nuclear industry. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and it's, and it's, there, it's, are, there are things to report all the time. It doesn't, we don't just have to have great big accidents. There's little accidents, yeah. little radiation releases all the time that are not reported. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, the denials that take place where people say, well, no one's really died from a nuclear reactor. No, that's not true. People right. have died in the reactors that have had accidents in the United States and in Europe yeah. over time. How yeah. many? We're not talking about huge numbers, but they have died. How many people have gotten sick? How many people mm -hmm. have walked around because the industry has irradiated them? That's a much larger yeah. figure. Yeah. About 20 years ago or so, we had a Hanford down winter as a guest in the program. We had people mm. from a couple of nonprofit groups working on that uh, as guests on this program. And, and one guest was a woman who was about my age bracket or a couple years younger and, and, and grew up downwind when the government, the federal government had deliberately released radiation just to see what would happen. Right, oh. and it's you been know. settled now in courts, and that's actually something that's just, well, guess what? The US DOE, in relation Department to those rele releases, yeah. the basically what's called the green run, that was just a yeah. code word for the iodine that they released in the yeah. air, they've settled with a lot of people who are downwinders. 
finally yeah. after all these years, and they've settled it not in the legislature, but in the courts. It's been a very expensive process, and a lot of people have passed on even. Uh -huh. yeah. But it's been something that at least they recognize. Do they keep it quiet? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. And downwinders means those who received radiation because the wind carried it to where they lived. Right. And, which, and the wind always changes. We may have prevailing winds from one way, but it changes. Yeah. Like, like in Japan, like mm -hmm. in Fukushima, right. people yeah. have to be on top right. of that. We all are affected. Yeah. There, there's a, a bit of information I want to cover about nuclear waste that we haven't yet gotten into, but we don't have a lot of time for it. But just the, the sense that um, the, there's, there's waste that's being stored on site because... Yes. We are decades and decades away from a permanent national site. The Yucca Mountain thing is not going to happen. No. And, and, and they don't have a plan, and they're decades and decades away. So stuff is being stored on site in ways that are not very stable, not very safe, overloaded, overcrowded, inadequately protected, and on and on and on. Um, and to transport them is even more dangerous. Right. Yeah. right. So, so it's like there's no good solution. You can't, it's hard to leave it where it is, but it's, it could be even worse to transport it. And especially with that reactor again, it's too bad that we have to pick on GE and that designed reactor out at, out at Hanford. But that, that reactor is top heavy with that swimming pool right. it's the, of the, the spent waste fuel. Is up on top. It's, it's up on top, and there's two full loads of reactor fuel that's been irradiated. It's more dangerous than anything more, that's, yeah. that's actually in the reactor right. right now. That thing is heavy with 800, 860,000 gallons of water all the time circulating in that pool yeah. 24 yeah. hours a yeah. day. If that, if that thing starts to shake back and forth, from, a, from an earthquake, yeah. well, that's what that happened. thing will go. That's what happened in Fukushima. Yeah. And the building holding the cooling pool up above was damaged. Broke down, and then they, and they exploded. And there was great risk for um, the cooling pool in reactor number two that it, it could go critical, yeah. start exploding. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So the, when, when, when we have this waste, and the waste you know, stays dangerous for thousands, tens of thousands, many, 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 many thousands of years, Who's going to pay for that cost in the future? So if I if I have a cup of coffee today and I use up some electricity, and Puget Sound Energy, which provides electricity for Thurston County, where we where we are right now, uses a mixture of coal and hydro and nuclear, very little wind. Some of the uh, electricity that went in to make my coffee was made with nuclear, nuclear. power, and that the waste from that, somebody's going to have to pay for that for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years and keep it safe. If if my cup of coffee that I made at home for actually a few cents, because I don't buy coffee at a commercial coffee shop, I make it at mm. home for cheap. You're such but a cheapskate. But if I look at the, the cost of the nuclear waste, yeah. you know. And caring it, for that waste. It, it's expensive. It's well, the, the well, example like, is what we talked about in terms of the Trojan plant. Who yeah. was, that was online early. It cost much that, less. That to, was down to in the fill. Columbia River. Uh, they decommissioned of, it. Yeah, sort of across from Longview. That's right. Kelso <laughs> area. It looks like it's in and, Washington State, but it's actually but it's, in it's Oregon. Across the river in Oregon. Yeah, but they still have 800 fuel uh, assemblies in the, in a water pool mm -hmm. circulating yeah. on mm -hmm. the site. Everything else is taken out. It's been decommissioned. The towers have been brought, blown up and brought down. So they still have radioactive waste that's yeah. very insecure yeah. at the site, probably with a fence around it. I don't know yeah. in terms of anything more than that. Yeah. I'd like to speak to the longevity of some of this waste. Yes, please. Some of it is very short-lived, that it's, that it's lethal, and some of it is uh, lethal for incomprehensible amounts of time. So plutonium is one of the most um, dangerous elements on this earth, and uh, it's a man-made element. And the, it is um, lethal for 250,000 years. That's about as long as Homo sapiens has been erect and walking around. And if you take the depleted uranium in those weapons, which is a little off our topic, but the, um, it would take 4.6 billion years for that depleted uranium not to be lethal and it's blowing around in yeah. the wind. And that is the time of our, our, our cosmos. Yeah, and depleted is a euphemism because it's yeah, still it's very... Not, 
it's, it's minimally depleted from original, and it's, yeah, but that, that's another euphemism where the government is misleading us. Um, we, we, when we were preparing for the program, uh, Carolyn, you said that nuclear power is not necessary. Uh, and you described it as a boiling reactor, like like yes. a, a big teapot. Tell us. So, what a what boiling your water is. reactor is is um, is like a giant teapot. It takes all this nuclear fuel power, risking all this danger, spending all this money to boil water. Mm -hmm. Now, Grandma put a cast iron pot on the stove and boiled water. It was a lot cheaper, and it's like. You know, why do we need all of this just to boil water? It's like firing up your chainsaw to cut a stick of soft butter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, a couple books that you recommend, um, and we'll have these in the closing credits. One is by Lester Brown, one is by Arjun Makajani. Um, the Lester Brown's book, The Great Transition Shifting from Fossil Fuels to Solar and Wind Energy, sounds very good. I could see this on a website um, www.earth-policy.org and then uh, Arjun Makajani's Carbon Free and Nuclear Free, a Roadmap for U.S. Energy Policy and there's a website for that. We'll right. have that. We don't have time to discuss them right now. But, uh, cause but these are descriptions of the ways that we do not need nuclear or fossil fuels to right. um, have our the energy we need. Right. We have better ways of doing it than these ways that we've proven to be dysfunctional, the nuclear and the fossil fuel approach both. Um, there are a lot of good organizations working on this, and we'll list those also in the closing credits. I want to just mention some right now uh, so people can be alert to these and then look for their websites in the closing credits. Uh, you're on the board. You're not a doctor, but you're on the board. I don't have a black bag with me. No, no, no. no. But it's uh, Phys Washington Phys PSR, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Yeah. We have a website that's for the task force that works on uh, shutting down CGS, and that's called, uh, uh, it's called Nuclear Free Northwest, right. just all, all written out, and yeah. then .org. And yeah. there's a lot of good information there. That sounds good. And, uh, it, you know, the thing about how do we change this, what we're trying to do is go to the PUDs, the ones the, that purchase the, the, the power, public, the public, the public utility, utility districts, district get some new people on board if we have to, but convince them that they can bring a vote to yeah. the Energy Northwest, previously whoops, yeah. and get things controlled. Yeah, so part of it is you have to know what, what, how the name's been changed. Yes. So whoops, Washington Public Power Supply System, it was a consortium of publicly owned utilities. Somebody made a mistake with some that. Some PUDs, the public, <laughs> own, public utility districts, yep. and some of the municipal, like Seattle Sea Light, Tacoma Sea Light, and then they Bought, they're make, running these nuclear plants. They went belly up on the bonds. Yes, biggest, it's the largest biggest bond failure in the United States history. history. Right, and and then they changed the name. So now it's Energy Northwest. That's right. So uh, and then then the instead of the whoops thing, it's it's the um, uh, uh, Columbia generating station, station. Which yeah is really sounds the, really nice it's really the, the the WNP2 the whoops 2 right brand. right right okay and then so the the organization that you mentioned is good and and the WPSR Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility we work with Oregon PSR on this yeah. and other groups uh, including the Sierra Club right. and including and, Hanford and, Challenge and I found a good way to, to get information is to do a web search for WPSR plus Columbia Generating Station, and then a whole bunch of stuff comes up. Good. And that's a great way to do it. Uh, you recommended, and I also financially support a group called Beyond Nuclear, it's www.beyondnuclear.org, uh, Nuclear Information and Resource Service. NIRS.org. You also mentioned uh, Nuclear Energy and Information, information Service, Service. Mm -hmm. uh, NEIS.org. Yeah. I like also the Union of Concerned Scientists. They're yep. good on a bunch of issues. They've right. visited our sites and they've come out and right. spoken with yeah. us out and here. The, their website is www.ucusa.org. Uh, and then click our work and then click nuclear power. 
and a whole bunch of stuff comes out there. Yeah. The, there is all kinds of information about nuclear on these sites, and if somebody says to you, well, nuclear is safe, you can go and find fact sheets, yeah. you can find reams of information. Yeah, yeah. and these folks very are all, all really, really good expert, and they explain things very well. I, I and they are the people they are. who have the beyond nuclear and near and nice are the people who have their fingers in the dike of nuclear. Yeah, and right. we all should be very grateful for yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. There, the, the, some of these organizations are in there, uh, holding the government accountable, holding the holding the nuclear industry accountable, holding the, the nuclear regulatory uh, commission accountable. And, and you know, we don't we don't blame stuff. these workers out at the Tri Cities for being involved in uh, an actual yeah. nuclear pr yeah. plants production. But w there's a lot more safer ways to do it, and alternative energy, replaceable, renewable energy, is a good option that right. we have right in front of us. Right and, in front and, of us, and creates more jobs it than, does. than the stuff that we're doing. Right. I want to put in a plug also for the the YouTube presentation you have. That's kind of like what you showed us here, but but more more thorough. Uh, Carolyn's photos and experiences and insights are at her YouTube presentation called "The Wisdom from Fukushima." So you can visit youtube.com and search for the wisdom from Fukushima and you have a presentation and then mm -hmm. there's a separate document or separate program that's a, a Q&A. Right. Uh, and you're also willing to speak to other audiences and your phone is 360-438-5424. Email is carolyn uh, at planetcare.us. And you also recommend newsstories.org and you mentioned that right briefly in your presentation right. here. Can I say one quick word yes. about what we as citizens need to do? Yes. It isn't just these organizations. It's every one of us. Because nuclear is everywhere around the world. Some nearer to great tragic places like Fukushima and some just ordinary people like you and me. But what you and I can do is wake up and stay awake, stay informed, get reliable sources of information, which Glenn has just mm -hmm. given you some, and make choices and take action. Yeah. And all of that needs to happen from us. Right, because what the system tries to do is say, sit down, shut up, we've got this under control, and we're not gonna tell you what's going on, but just trust us. And we know better than, than to fall for that. So Carolyn's advice about getting informed, getting active, that's exactly what, what we need to do. Um, it's like the, the women in the support group that you mentioned, where the, the women are finally able to tell their stories, yes. share their feelings, mm -hmm. and grapple with it. So you can, people can deal with these problems in a, uh, in, in a healthy way. In a proactive it's, way. Yeah it's, yeah. it's awfully hard to deal with it, and yeah. we need each other to right. deal with it. So I want to thank Carolyn Treadway and Tom Buchanan for sharing information. I want to thank the folks who've been watching. This whole nuclear power thing is an extremely complex, extremely expensive, and extremely dangerous way to boil water so the steam can turn uh, gen uh, turbines to uh, generate electricity. We can do that in a way, way, way better way, more sensibly, more safely. And people are resilient. People can empower themselves to act uh, in the kinds of constructive ways that, that, that Carolyn and Tom are, are urging. So I encourage us to practice resilience and creativity to meet our needs before disaster strikes here. You can get information about a wide variety of issues related to peace, social justice, and nonviolence by contacting the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation, 360-491-9093, www.olympiafor.org. We are all one human family. We all share one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it and the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks, watch these closing credits and take some notes.